is for unprecedented challenges on the political trenches, local government at work. Our guest today is Walter Schwabi. With over 20 years of public speaking experience, Walter has advised thousands of business professionals, public sector employees, and elected officials from all three levels of government. He is a passionate serial tech entrepreneur with over 25 years of experience, having most recently held the position on the board as CEO of visual AI startups, Dream ML Incorporated. Walter has owned or has been a partner in multiple tech companies over the years. For the past 20 years, he has also been a public speaker, having presented on stage in front of thousands of people. He has routinely educated live audiences on subjects related to leadership, innovation, and emerging technologies, and their impact on business and government. So with that, welcome to the Political Trenches, Walter. Well, it's uh, great to be here, Chris uh, and Ian. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, well, let's get right into it then, Walter. Uh, you're no stranger to local government, <clears throat> working with local governments and local government people. Uh, you and I have known each other for a lot of years, so I'm really, it's interesting. I think I probably, you're turning the tables on you from times we've gone by where you've probably interviewed me about something, but because we are sticking primarily or exclusively to the role of AI and local government, where do you see AI either being used now or potentially being used in coming years within the realm of local governments? Well, as many of your viewers may, you know, be well aware already that the, the last year AI has been on the tip of everybody's tongue uh, for all sorts of reasons, but predominantly uh, a massive domino got knocked over. And, and that is, I don't think that, you know, society at large was was really quite prepared for all of the change that, that started to happen and that is changing, uh, uh, will continue to change going forward. And that largely happens to, uh, you know when when new tech comes and and is and is released but in this case automation largely around administrative duties repetitive duties things that require um you know pattern recognition it's kind of like the the mind numbing tasks that we all do from time to time um uh, the rubber stamping of of things that automation is is taking hold and and what that's going to do is change dramatically the way the workforce looks um, and acts uh, today. So uh, one word that you may have heard before is upskilling. And um, everybody's going to have to get to know that word pretty quickly. Good. Well, thanks. Are there any places you think, so if we look at uh, the, the local government sector as well, are there any places you, you think AI won't have an impact? Um, yeah, well, you know, construction. I mean, you know, uh, Elon Musk is building his... Uh, Optimus Prime, a Tesla robot. Um, there's a lot of robotics that's being done, but it's it's even though it's making you know pretty big strides and pretty quickly, I think faster than a lot of people are expecting. Uh, robotics is still lagging behind where AI uh, algorithms are are solving software related types of problems uh, far more quickly. So. Um, you know, if you're in construction or you're in public works, these kinds of things where you physically have to go to some place and, you know, crank a valve or do something of that nature, you're probably a lot more safe than if you were to be sitting in an administrative office right now. For example, there's a whole host of things that could be automated as a result of, of being an elected official from, you know, mayor and councillors to um, the chief administrative officer. In fact, I've got in my in my presentation, I go down a whole host of things that that will soon be automated as a part of their tasks. So I want to jump in there for a second because we, we've sort of painted a rosy picture here, but I'm the doom and gloom type of person who always looks at the negative sides of anything new that comes out. Um, what do you see as sort of the main challenges or concerns associated with implementing AI into the government process? Because Right now, we are seeing a major concern about privacy breaches and even security breaches for organizations. Is this a concern that municipalities should sort of be warranted about before they sort of dip their toe into the AI pool? Well, actually, um, first of all, this show isn't long enough to dive down this rabbit hole. The, the, the reality is, is that um, I'll give you just a, a brief bit of background the, the, the fact is, is that um, OpenAI released ChatGPT 
you know, without having solved for control and containment. And, and what that really means is that um, as the level of intelligence of the algorithms that we're talking about, these large language models, um, as they continue to evolve, we're, we're inching closer to something, you know, called super intelligence or artificial general intelligence. The problem is, though, that we as humanity have not solved uh, for being able to control that. And so uh, very rapidly, and, and the, you know, these numbers are changing all the time. It's, it's the fastest moving tech um, environment that I've ever experienced in my personal life. And, and I'm sure, you know, just about everybody else will say the same thing. Um, the fact is, is that uh, by, you know, some say 2030, uh, we will not be the smartest being on the planet. So while you talk about cybersecurity in a municipal government, in, you know, IT infrastructure, what we need to do is take a step back and understand that what happens when we're not the smartest uh, cats on the block anymore and um, we're not calling the shots as a result of that? Uh, in fact, the, you know, things are happening at a pace that, uh, you know, will cascade to just accelerating that effect. Uh, there's something called the singularity, and I won't go, uh, you know, really into that. But by 2045, it is predicted that AI will be as smart as every human being, all 8 billion of us, on the planet. So on this side, our entire global population and all of our collective intelligence. On this side, an AI who is smarter than all of that. Hmm. So um, that's the context <laughs> and the backdrop. By which I was joking about, about doom and gloom, Walter. <laughs> <laughs> but you've really gotten me scared here because I've got to sort of, and I apologize to interrupt here, but I've got to ask because it's, it, you're talking and it's concerning me. So are you saying that municipalities shouldn't adapt to the AI world that we live in, or should we be cautious about the introduction of AI into uh, sort of the municipal realm? Okay, so the number one, it, it's ironic in a sense, but the number one thing that we have to do is not be fearful of AI and run away from it. As municipal governments, we need to run towards it and we need to embrace it rapidly, but we need to do it uh, very specifically. The number one thing that, that municipal governments across this country need to do is start developing AI governance frameworks right now, not yesterday or not, I mean, not uh, tomorrow, but today. Um, it needs to be the number one thing on the agenda. I don't care about climate change. I don't care about crime. I don't care about real estate and, and land sales. Those are all on the list, except they're all trumped by this, okay? And so the reality is, is that um, if you don't have, as a municipal government, a framework by that has a set of rules that says, look, we are only going to adopt uh, AI that has been responsibly developed. And then we have a, a, a framework by which we're going to use to measure that. And the reason why that's the point is because that, that sort of doom and gloom picture that, that I just relayed, by the way, it's not, I'm not the only guy on the planet saying these kinds of things. Um, the, this, this is research that uh, the absolute top experts, um, and that's kind of a cliche statement, but the reality is, is that the, the godfather of AI for Google quit his job so that he could, he could talk freely about the concerns about AI uh, related to what I've just said. Um, he's not the only one. I, there's a long list, okay? Um, and so the, the, the fact is, is that this needs to be a priority. It needs to be on everybody's uh, tongue and uh, the tip of their tongue and start working on it right now. And the, the, the tech is changing so quickly. Typically in Canada, uh, municipal governments are approximately 10 years behind in terms of tech adoption rates compared to our US counterparts, okay? We cannot afford to be that slow in this regard, okay? We just can't. The EU has just launched a, the, the AI Act in Canada. We have a, a draft, um, 
act that is not into law yet for AI and data, uh, but it doesn't go far enough. And and here's the here's the other thing. Let's say that we all control, we all try to control the AI from getting so far advanced that we haven't, um, you know, we haven't implemented human values and human ethics. And this is the real concern, okay? Because if AI was developed by nothing but criminals who don't have any real ethics or morals, right? Well, then the AI is going to reflect that in its development and evolution, okay? Um, that's the problem is it's only going to take one person with a billion dollars to set up a large language model. This could be a rogue nation. This could be a dictator. This could be somebody, you know, a criminal uh, enterprise that does this. And, and then it's released. So uh, I, I presented in, in Manitoba just uh, over a month ago, and I challenged them all 137 municipalities to come together very quickly and write an open letter that they are in support of responsible AI development. And the reason why this is an important step is because it sends the message to their brand new premier who can then send the message up the chain to the federal government. And then of course, hopefully inspire the other provinces and uh, territories to do something similar. It puts it on the top of mind for everybody, okay? And so uh, why is that? Well, it's because uh, Goldman Sachs, for example, predicts that by 2030, there'll be approximately 300 million jobs across Europe and North America that will be displaced. So in other words, for example, this entire conversation could be held by uh, uh, AI avatars right now. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't be putting me out of a job here <laughs> there, Walter. <laughs> I love I love it. my show. Yeah. My husband has been telling me that I, AI could do my job and I uh, I can punch him. Not he's really, not, though. He's not wrong. Um, it, it could be done today with text uh, script to video. It, it's, it's, and in fact, uh, AI only needs three seconds of our voice sampling to, uh, it's so good today that the Beatles were able to launch a uh, a new, publish a brand new song with John Lennon's voice after AI had a sampling that it was so accurate that they were launching a song. So lots of things are on the go. And, and if you're an elected official, uh, you're an, in the administration of a municipal government, this has got to be a priority. It just has to be. You can't look at it and go, oh, it's just, I don't need to worry about that. It's just chat GPT, right? Even from a, a public data perspective and how we manage data, uh, where it gets stored, how that gets set up, that has to be very specific, okay? And I'm gonna, we're because, gonna ask, I'm gonna ask you about that in a few minutes here, but I wanna throw it over to Ian for a second because we have a lot more questions here <laughs> and you're answering all the questions before we ask them, that's not how AI sure. works, yeah. Walter. We're not necessary, I guess, there, Chris, even now. <laughs> so the Go. question. Hey, I get on a roll. I apologize. <laughs> See, I, I had warned Chris about this, yeah. the uh, or maybe explained it rather than warned it. You, uh, Walter, you've been talking quite a bit here. The things that uh, Chris made the reference to doom and gloom, and you've been talking about things we have to be prepared for and watch out for. Is there an upside to the use of AI? Oh, I mean, the, the, this is the, this is the uh, you, you know, I have a, a label or a title for one of my presentations, which is the, I call it the AI paradox. Because on, on one side, the amount of, you know, really amazing things from, you know, compliance, bylaw compliance to uh, all of, a lot of things that take a whole lot of people to do shuffle paper, go through a bunch of stuff. You know, that stuff's going to happen a whole lot quicker, way faster and more accurately. Um, so you put this into the context of, say, healthcare, put this in the context of, you know, crime prevention. There's all sorts of positives that uh, will come out of the implement implementation of this technology. Um, you know, in my past, in the, in one of the role that you had mentioned there, Chris, uh, at StreamML, we, we helped the city of uh, Kelowna count trees more accurately. So really counting these assets within the municipal boundaries far more accurately than they could before, right? And so it's just something as simple as, and it wasn't simple actually at all, but 
uh, counting trees. You know, if you just state it that way, it sounds like a simple task, but in, in, in reality, it's really quite difficult. So uh, leveraging the technology in, in, in so many ways, the, the benefits are gonna be tremendous. What it means though, is that we as a society then have to be prepared for the change. That means that if I, my job was to count trees yesterday, what am I now upskilling to do something else within the municipal government, right? To continue, you know, hopefully keep my job or, uh, you know, do a different job uh, entirely, right? So we have to be, our number one superpower has to be our willingness to adapt and change. Those individuals who leverage AI in their job will be more solid than those people who don't use AI at all. So AI plus human is greater than just human. Good, thanks. I'd like to move it to the political realm a little bit. So far, you've talked quite a lot about doing stuff. There are decisions that end up being made for the long-term benefit of the people who happen to live in a particular place or a particular region. Where do you see AI being used or even abused by either elected officials or candidates or those types of folks? The largest concern I have for elected officials, and we're going to see this happen next year. Uh, well, actually, sorry, this year. Um, <laughs> uh, I just got caught. Uh, you know, we're going to see this in terms of deep fakes. So uh, deep fakes, and we 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 chuckled about avatars taking our jobs here in this in this conversation. But what if someone was to take our image, our voice, and create an entire video saying a whole bunch of really horrible things that I didn't say or you didn't say? And, you know, we're all three elected officials. And now, of course, uh, it just gets thrown out there, right? So how do, you, how do you protect against that? How do you verify and validate the message that's coming at you? Uh, you know, even if it looks like, and there's, there's an interesting um, TikTok account uh, called Deep Fake. Tom Cruise. And I, I, you know, I just inspire you to look at it. And basically it's a guy who has similar, you know, not obviously identical to Tom Cruise, but the AI lays a mask over top of his face and it looks really close. And then also the voice. So his mannerisms, he has to act like Tom Cruise, but um, it's really kind of freaky. And he, he's not the only one that uh, has, you know, adopted this technology to play around with it. But Deep fakes, I think, are probably from a elected official issue. And, and you know, look, um, there, there's actually just, uh, I think it's just within the last couple of weeks, in fact, uh, there was a uh, an article out in a small town where some kids were playing around with some AI and, and, and was, you know, they kind of went too far. So the, the, the fact is, is that um, back in, what, the mid 2000s, we were talking about social media and, and you know, how to how to interact in a world that was filled with social media applications. And I mean, 2009, 2010, it's nothing like today. So uh, AI is uh, the new tool for mischief in a lot of ways. And of course, the industry has to self-regulate and but policymakers have to come out and uh, start talking about policy as well. Okay, so I'm going to pick up there because while you've been talking, I've been thinking about that exact question. You're telling governments to adapt, adapt to the changing world that we live in with open AI that's coming out with chat GTP. But we live in a society, if you go to any social media right now, you will see people saying government has too much control over our lives. How do you tell a government to regulate what the industry can do? and still keep the evolution and the adaptation of open AI a thing that people can use, even if it's for nefarious reasons, because let's be honest, people will do random things with photos already and it's illegal. So how do you regulate and adapt at the same time? Well, it, it's it's kind of interesting because, um, you know, number one, uh, what people will realize, come quickly and realize is that they're they're going to, once they wrap their head around why this is so important and how powerful. So here's the thing, uh, it, AI, artificial general intelligence will get to a point where um, it will become so adept at understanding our emotional intelligence that it will be able to manipulate us. We won't be able to tell the difference. Now, I want you to think about that just for a minute, because Do all of those gloom. people that you were talking about who are going to gripe 
about government having already too much control. And quite frankly, I'm in that camp, right? Okay. The, the point is, though, in this particular case, the cat has been let out of the bag already, and we're playing a really dangerous game of catch up. And we're so far behind in terms of policy. Uh, we're so far behind in terms of regulatory uh, implementation that uh, we really have to get on it. And um, the fact is, is that one of the people haven't solved for this problem. The, 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 the prevailing wind is we're going to control the chips. There's a company in Taiwan. Don't need to mention who it is, but there's a company in Taiwan. It's the 13th largest company on the planet. And it has $410 billion to huck at developing the AI processing chips that everybody else needs, like everybody else. So if you want to start to control and throttle this back a bit, you're going to have to control the chip manufacturing, right? That's one way to do it, okay? Um, so what governments need to do is start pushing forward in terms of um, how to develop AI in a responsible way, a set of ethics, a set of, right? They already have a set of principles that they've already stated, right? They have those principles. Well, then integrate that uh, with this AI governance framework and start doing it. And I got to tell you, they're going to, the, the general public's going to want that because if they don't, then that means that anybody with facial recognition software could be leveraging that to watch you and I walk down the street, right? Not just governments, right? So um, the, the, the adoption rate of this technology, proliferation is in fact our biggest problem. OK, because up to this point, as a society, we have been uh, saying yes to faster, yes to smarter, yes to smaller. Right. Uh, but now the biggest challenge we're going to have going forward is to say no to that. And that's really tough. OK, not everybody's going to want to do that. OK, so we're going to have to have regulatory uh, barriers and guardrails in place. So I have one last question before I throw it over to Ian and that. So I actually just texted him because I have one more because I wanted to get this one in. We talk about regulation. We talk about adaptation. The, this AI is rapidly evolving every single day. Like you said, it, it is changing. The, what was yesterday is completely different from what today is. How should governments, how should municipalities approach ongoing training and development for their staff because the staff are going to be the ones who are going to be implementing some of this open ai into their day-to-day -day workflow there is no training manual for open ai right now there are people who are coming up with training manuals but in the government sense there is no true manual for how to implement it into the government what training should governments, municipalities be looking at or what what should municipalities be looking at to bring in someone to help with the imp integration of open AI or even AI into municipal governments? Well, I mean, this is this would be an obvious place for a plug. Um, but... That's why we brought you on the show here, Walter. <laughs> <laughs> But, the, you know, for the last, I would say, six and a half years or so, I, I've been immersed my, immersing myself in artificial intelligence before OpenAI released ChatGPT. So uh, I've been studying that space and then, of course, then working in that space. Uh, and so uh, understanding the, the, the critical steps that I think a municipality needs to start thinking about and, and taking going forward, but at a very high level, the number one thing that, that you need to start thinking about if, as a municipality is data management and data governance. That's that's number one, because all of this is data. Right. And, and so how are we managing that and how are we going to protect it uh, as a as stewards of public data? We need to know what we're going to do there. Now, and, and it has to go beyond what they already do. OK. And, and I'll give you an example why. Uh, because not too long ago, I'd, I'd read a part about that AI had learned to hack your computer, my computer, by sending a signal based on the frequency of the fan inside the laptop. So it was hacking a computer based on the frequency because uh, it can send, you know, signals 
via frequencies, right? I mean, that's that's radio, that's right. And it figured it out that it, it could identify a laptop via a fan frequency. And then, and, and I mean, I mean, I'm sorry, but none of us on this call are even thinking at that level, right? So the point is, is that these protocols have had got to adapt and evolve. And so data management and storage is, is where you start. The, the next thing you need to start thinking about is upskilling your staff um, and, and preparing them for other roles within the municipality. It's not gonna necessarily mean that everybody needs to do it today, but there are definitely segments of the municipal workforce that should be definitely looking at upskilling and thinking about other ways to leverage their skills. Skills like can soft I, skills. Can, can I put you on the spot here for a second, Walter? And I sure. hate to interject. That's the point of this whole show, I would think. Which right? department? I'm going to hold you to this one because you're saying some municipal workers should be looking at upskilling. Sure. What departments in particular? Is it finance? Oh, Is it anything, communications? Uh, finance, uh, communications, um, legal, okay, administration, HR, all of those areas. Anything administratively that doesn't involve you picking up a shovel. Um, it, you know, that kind of scenario, uh, you know, public works, uh, parks and rec, where there is very much hands on a lot of human relations, those things less so. However, yeah. um, you know, autonomous vehicles are being strongly considered. I remember years ago, I was saying autonomous vehicles are coming down the pike. We're going to have to think about that. Well, today, you know, there are autonomous vehicles, construction related uh you know, efforts and so on. So, you know, I would say administration, I would say elected officials, uh, all aspects of administration. There's 46% of those jobs that I had mentioned earlier are administrative related. Every <laughs> municipal to... politician who is listening to this just heard <laughs> elected official and said, am I out of a job here soon? No, oh, it's not so much. I don't think that you're out of a job as an elected official. And by the way, I've, I've ran for council and, and in the past. And so is Ian. And uh, Chris, I don't know if you've ever done that. Yeah. <laughs> it, hey, it's so, the loser club, I'm assuming. <laughs> so we, we, that's right. Yeah. Or the winner's club, depending on how you look at it. Um, <laughs> you know, it, 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 so the, the fact is, is that um, the, the, the role will change. It may not mean that uh, AI, you'll have a municipal government fully um, administered by AI, but by the way, that could happen um, unless we regulate for it, right? So the, the EU, for example, put rules into the place that no AI that made um, uh, its own decisions, and there's a definition there, can be deployed within the European Union, right? But there's definitions, okay? you have to start thinking like that. Otherwise you will get a municipal government that's completely AI run, right? So, you know, it, it, it's the, it's kind of a surreal thing to think about, but I have to tell you, it's not, it's not futuristic to be uh, getting caught up to speed as to where we're at, where it's going. And again, we, that might make us feel very uncomfortable as elected officials in Canada, right? However, maybe somebody in another country is like, hey, I love this. Let's do this. This is where this is the most efficient government we could figure out. Right. And that's the domino that gets knocked over. So we have to we have to really start thinking about this from a different perspective. I'm not sure if I should call you Dr. Evil or Lex Luthor at this point. <clears throat> Uh, you know what? I've, I haven't been called either. I get the Lex Luthor reference just because of the aerodynamics, <laughs> I'm hoping, not because I, I, I am truly evil. Um, but, you know, it is a uh, it is a very serious um, area. And it, and it Chris, your, your reaction of shock initially is is one that is pretty common. I mean, I could tell you there was nearly a thousand people in that room in, in Brandon and it was very quiet um, because I had their attention and uh, you know, and I was told that actually, but it was very quiet. They were listening intently and it's about, it's about giving them a process and a formula for how to proceed going forward, right? It's one thing to just feel hopeless, like it's all over. It's another thing to say, hey, we've got some work to do. It's very important. It's very serious and it's urgent. You've, uh, well, to the last while you've been talking a lot about kind of current state, potential future state. 
and we haven't had time to delve into this. You made a reference to that earlier too. Are there places, and as we wrap up, are there places and people, tools that you might suggest that people who watch and listen to this podcast might be able to use to educate themselves a little bit more? About uh, else? Well, uh, you know, there, <laughs> the the amount of tools, uh, you know, is expanding rapidly. But I, I there's a few of my favorites that I, I kind of like to uh, like to go to. So, I mean... Lots of folks will have heard, at least, of Chat GPT, which is a large language model. It's a chatbot, right? Uh, but what's interesting about this is that uh, I use a an application called Perplexity.ai, and I'll, Perplexity is a research chatbot. So I don't actually go to Google anymore. And the reason I don't go to Google, and the reason why their search business is under attack is because of um, AIs like this that will, you will type in a question, like for example, you know, what is the ideal size of X, right? This, you know, and it will go back and it'll research all the answers for you and then display those citing the, the sources. Whereas if you were to type that into Google search window, you would get just a host of a whole bunch of stuff that would come back and you'd have to go figure it out for yourself, right? So perplexity saves me a tremendous amount of time by giving me the research to the precise question I've asked, which I really appreciate. Now it's still a little bit general generalized, okay? But it's pretty accurate and it's pretty good. So that's one example, that's just one scenario uh, to try. Um, pi.ai, so P-I, which stands for personal intelligence.ai. Um, this was launched by um, the, the original co-founder of Google's DeepMind. At one point, DeepMind was the most powerful AI company in the world. It got bought out by Google. He then set the ethical framework for how Google would build AI. Uh, he does state that the majority of this um, and his last name is Suleiman. Um, he's launched Pi because he wants it to be more ethical, more morally focused. And so it's a it's a really nice conversational chatbot compared to anything else that you'll use out there. And I really like the the purpose behind it. Uh, and in fact, that's moving towards the therapy. So if you're a therapist, you're a psychologist, you're a psychiatrist, all of those areas in terms of therapy, there are chatbots that have uh, just absorbed everything about that area, right? And now, as long as they can have that sort of soft human approach, accurately come back, and now you've got a therapist in your phone. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot, Walter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, so, I'm just, I, I feel weird being the only one who doesn't use Google or any chat GTP. I'm still using Dogpile for God's sakes. Like I'm going back to the hail, hail cool. days. I still got yeah. my MySpace account here, guys. Um, I, I want to talk about sort of the, the last question that I have, and it's about sort of the, the general topic of today's episode, which is unprecedented challenges. Now we've talked about what AI has done up till now. And there's always going to be something new. There's always going to be something better in the years to come. We didn't have chat GTP at the beginning of 2023. And now look at where we are at the end of, at the beginning of 2024. What do you see on the horizon as sort of an unprecedented challenge in the open AI world that governments, municipalities will have to face moving forward oh well all of this is is all of this essentially is unprecedented right you know when we started when open ai launched chat gpt um there was one two possibly three large language models they were the first to launch there's over and they're not even the largest that that's not even the largest one and, and uh, uh but there are over at last count 54 large language models operating around the world right now. So for different reasons, for different purposes, but uh, and some of them are dealing with trillions of data points, okay? Um, we're not even talking billions anymore. And so uh, the, the, the rate at which that is happening is 
that proliferation effect I was telling you before about, that, that's one of the largest challenges that we as a society have. Um, and so th that's why governments have to move so quickly to try to keep, this is gonna be the fastest, I think, that, that global governments will have to react to regulating a certain segment because if they don't, right, the the recipe we don't get a second chance. Let's just put it that way, right? And by the way, um, it's not that nuclear war, the threat of nuclear war, isn't a an, a really important thing. Um, it's that we can, you know, as humans, sort of control whether one or the other pushes a button, right? But if, you know, you have to rely on that, that sort of human ethics and morals to, to not push the button, even though you want rattle the saber. Well, when it comes to AI, once that's out of, the, out of our control, it's smarter than us and it has unlimited resources, okay? If it wants to protect, and by the way, once AI develops its own emotional intelligence and sense of self, that is the trigger point. That's the lightning rod. OK, because the second that it develops its own emotional intelligence quotient and its sense of self, well, what's the number one thing on its mind right after that second? Right. Self-preservation. OK, so that doesn't necessarily mean, though, that there are going to be massive, you know, that this is where the words Terminator and, you know, Skynet start usually coming up into the conversation. <laughs> right. Uh, in fact, it, it, the issue, though, is it's much more likely that th that's inefficient. That's an inefficient use of resources. OK, it's great for Hollywood, but massive, massive robot manufacturing just to eliminate humans, not likely. What's much more likely is a very, you know, unique bio um, virus that we a novel biohazard virus that we just won't see coming. Because all the atoms that we make up, it will want for its use. And yes, you are listening to the lighthearted show, The Political <laughs> Trenches, Local Government at Work. Yes. Um, Walter, I want to thank you so much for taking time and sitting down with us. Really? To our listeners and to our viewers, the link to Walter's social media pages and website are in the show notes. So if you want to learn more, reach out to him or even find out where he's going to be speaking next, head over to his website. I'm assuming it's all there. I did a deep dive when, where, where I found a little bit more about him. So head over there and check it out. But Walter, thank you so much for talking us through and now giving me nightmares about the unprecedented challenges that governments face in 2024. Thank you so much. I'm only the messenger. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Walter. One, one of them. But thank you so much, Chris. And uh, Ian, I really appreciated the opportunity to speak with you and your audience. And I hope that, uh, you know, it, it's not uh, necessarily all doom and gloom, but it is. it should be taken seriously. Mm -hmm.